I went to work at a guide dog facility. Now, what I learned there was dramatically different from what I learned in college. College was very animal science based. It was very focused on prepping you for maybe med school or if you wanted to be a vet tech. But when you go out into the real world and you start working with these dogs that have been selectively bred, then they spend a year with an individual who's dedicated to teaching them just obedience and daily life skills. Then they come in and the trainer says, okay, we're going to teach all of these specific skills. You're looking at almost building a robot. And I started talking with other trainers and taking on their advice from 40, 50 years of experience, which is probably the biggest change in my learning. So when I was in college, I had professors, they had PhDs in genetics, they had you know 50 years of training experience. But then you go and you sit down with 15 trainers who have 20, 30, 40 years of training experience. Why did you do that specific thing, that specific way? And I get a different answer from each person. Hello and welcome to Tom Meets Interesting People. This is the podcast where I meet everybody from voice actors to nuclear engineers to talk about their work, their projects and their processes. Now, some people have asked me, how long in advance do you record your podcasts? And all I've got to say right now is British people are struggling with driving in the snow. We cannot do it. I don't know why, but it's just a thing. Anyway, on to my guest today, and I have a question. Who let the dogs out? Well, probably my next guest, but those dogs are perfectly well trained, so they'll only come on command. Uh, Michael Asita is the founder of Matador Canine Brilliance and the host of the Acknowledged Dogs podcast. He's trained over 12,000 dogs, and in addition to that, um, I think he's going to be very proud that he's the father of a three-year-old with the coolest name, Odin. I mean, that is so cool, Michael. Yeah. Um, warm, warm welcome to the show. How are we doing today? I'm fantastic. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You're most welcome. Now, I want to know a bit about your early context. I want to know a little bit about how you got started this. How did you come to start dog training? Absolutely. So when I was younger, I have three older siblings and they all wanted to get into, you know, having a dog, not necessarily training one, but owning one. They wanted to cuddle it, wanted to play with it. And my parents were pretty adamant about that not happening. We didn't have pets. Mm -hmm. We didn't have cats. We didn't have dogs. We didn't, we didn't even have goldfish. And so when it was my turn to start asking for a dog, my older siblings were like, there's no way it's not happening. It's not happening. I said, you know what? I'm just going to stay with it. I'm going to keep asking, keep asking and hound my parents until we get one. Two years go by, they did not budge. It was not happening. I said, I really want a dog. What do I got to do? And they said, well, if you learn enough, maybe we can get a dog. If you can prove that you know everything you need to know and you're willing to put in the work. I said, okay. So I spent the next two years studying and learning and researching and doing everything I could. And they thought I was just going to give up at some point. That didn't happen. I was 16 years old. I ended up going and volunteering at a rescue. They got a dog with a name that was synonymous with the beach that my family used to go to all the time. It's called Breezy Point. So the dog's name was Breezy. My dad said he always wanted a black lab, and that was my ticket. That was the the in into dog training. Got that dog, brought it home, did everything I could to educate her and educate myself, but realized I didn't know as much as I thought I did. So I started learning more and started reading more books and expanding my horizons until eventually I learned about a program. Uh, bachelor's of Technology program in animal science, where I could focus with a concentration in canine management and techniques, which is an absolute mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I ended up graduating in three years. It's a four-year degree. I graduated in three years. And then I went on to study uh, service dogs and guide dogs and police dogs at different facilities and internships. Right after that, I jumped into more of the obedience and agility kind of aspect of dog training, and it's just exploded since then working with behavior problems, aggressive dogs, uh, puppies, senior dogs with ailments, all of that stuff. I've, I've tackled almost every problem that you can imagine with a dog. Mm -hmm. I think let's, let's go back way back to Breezy. Tell, tell me about Breezy. How old were you when you got her? Absolutely. So I was 16 when we got her. We got her in September and she was only nine months old at the time. We ended up bringing her home and my parents said, okay, if she ruins anything, 
if she destroys the couch, if she destroys the garbage, if she makes a mess in the house. And we had white couches at the time, and this is a black lab, right? So she's going to make a mess on the couches. Yeah. And they said, if they destroy anything, we got to get rid of her. I said, okay, what am I going to do about this? And at the time, the first thing I thought of was, well, I got to get her tired. A tired dog is a good dog, right? A happy dog. Mm. And so we would bike in the morning, the afternoon, and the evening for two miles every single day. Two miles in the morning, two miles in the afternoon, two miles at night. So I'd wake up at five o'clock, do the two miles, go to school, come home, do my homework, run two miles again with her, or bike two miles with her. And then after dinner, I did the same thing. And she was just so exhausted. She didn't have any behavior problems. And I started to wean off of that and teach her you know, how to walk nice on leash, how to stop barking at people, how to recall. And one of the first tests of all of the skills that I had practiced with her was she ran out of the front door after a rabbit. She just bolted after one and we live near a main road. So my parents like freaked out. I ran outside. I call her name. She practically skidded on the cement, turned around, came right back to me, grabbed her, went inside. My parents were like, okay, Michael, maybe you do know what you're doing. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> you, maybe you do have something here. So it worked out in my benefit because I had to have a well-trained dog. I, I didn't want to get rid of her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So very much breezy is the, um, the reason. Yes. She is the, the catalyst, the catalyst for it. And there was a lot in the beginning that stressed me out, that worried me. And that's why I help so many people that I help now. They don't yeah. get to do the fun stuff that I get to do now with my other two dogs. You know, we get to do uh, adventures, we get to go kayak, we get to go agility, all the fun stuff that people don't get to see because they're struggling with having their dog walk next to them for 10 minutes on a walk. Mm -hmm. You just don't get to do the fun stuff without that. Mm -hmm. I think also something that's really come across as well is the absolute love you have for Breezy. And I've listened to some episodes of your podcast as well. The way you talk about her, it's sort of, it is, it is first love, isn't it? Yes, definitely. I mean, that was the first dog I ever had. First dog I really ever had a, a positive interaction with. My grandma had a dog. No one else in my family had a dog. But my grandma's dog, we weren't allowed to play with. Couldn't cuddle her. You couldn't touch her. It was very much, don't look at the dog. Don't touch the dog. The dog doesn't exist. And that mm. was just the the situation we were put into. And, and my parents were scared of dogs. My mom was particularly scared of dogs. And so when I found this dog that wanted to work with me, was engaged, would let me test things out and you know didn't get mad at me because I was still learning. We had a, a very special bond. So now whenever I go visit, she lives with my parents now. Whenever I go visit, she's all over me, all over the place, super excited. And so it, it, you don't get that really in anything else. Yeah. You know, like the yeah. love that a dog shares for you is single, singular. It doesn't happen anywhere else. And you have that connection yeah. that no one else has with the dog. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I'm reminded of my first dog, Tucker, a Springer Spaniel. Wow. Uh, absolutely adorable, adorable dog. Uh, went to go live in Lancashire um, mm. after we moved, which is I'm really, I'm still really sad about, but really happy, a really happy end to his life. It was wow. like, um, yeah, I think he lived for about twelve and a half. Well, so, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he, he one, had a good run. One of my favorite dogs is a spaniel. Her name was Luna. She could hold uh, three or four tennis balls in her mouth. I don't remember which one it was. She loved tennis balls. She was wild. <laughs> that's so cute. Um, you also mentioned you did some internships as well. Yes. I'm kind of curious about them. T tell me, tell me about those internships. Absolutely. So right after we graduated, or technically graduated, but you still had to do your internship after mm -hmm. college, I went to work at a guide dog facility. And so they're training dogs for the blind, and they also did as like a side thing. They trained service dogs for veterans with PTSD. Now, what I learned there was dramatically different from what I learned in college. College was very animal science based. It was very focused on prepping you for maybe med school or if you wanted to be a vet tech. And so I got all mm -hmm. the science and the chemicals and the genetics and all that stuff that we needed in order to have a well-balanced dog, a happy dog, a healthy dog, as well as some training, behavioral context, theory, and psychology. But when you go out into the real world and you start working with these dogs that have been selectively bred. Then they spend a year with an individual who's dedicated to teaching them just obedience and daily life skills. Then they come in and the trainer says, okay, we're going to teach all of these specific skills. You're looking at almost building a robot, but it's not, right? It's a dog. It has a personality. It has charisma. Yeah. Sometimes they mess up. Sometimes they do it exceptionally well. But you're really teaching them, what I want you to do is X, 
and this is how you do it. When you do it right, we reward you. When you don't do it right, we try again or there's a consequence. And yeah. so I started learning all of that and I started talking with other trainers and taking on their advice from 40, 50 years of experience, which is probably the biggest change in my learning. So when I was in college, I had professors, they had PhDs in genetics, they had you know 50 years of training experience. But then you go and you sit down with 15 trainers who have 20, 30, 40 years of training experience. So I just start absorbing all of this information and then using it in every situation that I can and asking questions and trying to dive in, okay, why did you do that specific thing that specific way? And I get a different answer from each person. It's very yeah. individualistic. So is that something that's sort of common in, in the dog training industry? Like every trainer is going to have their different approach. Every trainer is going Absolutely. to. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, there's actually really no regulation, at least in the United States for dog training. I know in some other countries there is, and there's different certifications you can get in dog training. But when it comes down to the bottom line, even if you got the certification, you might still train in a different way, right? Like my method, my system of training any behavior, any one behavior is very different from the next trainer. We might use a little bit more rewards and treats. They might use more toys. Another trainer might use more punishment methods where they're shouting at the dog or they tell the dog no or they correct the dog, right? So there's all of these different balances and it comes from their upbringing, but also their personality, my personality says that it's my fault if the dog doesn't perform. If the dog doesn't do well, it's because I didn't teach them what I wanted them to know, or I haven't set them up for success often enough with rewards at a high enough value, right? They just haven't had enough repetitions to understand that whenever I ask them to do something, they should do it. It's just enjoyable that way, right? Now, another trainer might say, well, the dog has to listen. If the dog doesn't listen, they're going to run out into the street and get hurt. They have to listen. So they start putting blame on the dog. If they put the blame on the dog, there's nothing they can necessarily do about it. So that's the different, at least one aspect of the different personalities when it comes to training dogs. Is this sort of why you started your own company instead of sort of eventually working for someone else? Is because of these different approaches, you could sort of take it your own way. Exactly. I had worked at another facility after the internships. I went to go work somewhere where we did a lot of canine fitness. So either seniors would come in and they had some issues with their hips and they needed to swim, or we had young dogs with a lot of energy, and they had to do something. And I disagreed with the head trainer on a, a couple of things, simply because he had been doing it for a long time <clears throat> with civilian dogs is what I'm going to call it, right? Just the yeah. everyday dog. And what he found was it was easier to break it down in more of a game style. He wanted training to be a game, which I completely agree with. But there were some technical pieces of scientifically tested training that I prefer that he didn't. He just didn't want to spend the time explaining in such depth for every single person who came in. He was like, okay, well, if I can just teach red light, green light, it becomes really easy. I would teach yeah. what's called stimulus control. I, my dog does it when I tell them to do it and they don't do it when I don't tell them to do it. The same concept of red light, green light. He just made a game out of it. I made more of a technical science aspect of it. But in that became different mechanics. So, you know, he might do one mechanic and I might do the other mechanic, but we would have a disagreement simply because I thought my way was faster and more efficient, although it took longer to teach the person in the beginning. He thought it was easier to teach the person in the beginning, and then you'd kind of fix things later on. So it's just a different mindset, but that's exactly why I started my own company. Besides some other aspects like COVID-19 shutting down that facility and yeah. some other things, I was like, okay, I got to do something. And I saw that there was a gap in dog training, which was the online space. Everything was in person. You either went to a, a park, you went to somebody's house, they came to your house, you went to a facility. And there were a, a few, only like two or three online programs if you didn't count YouTube. And so I kind of plugged myself into that space, knowing it was going to be a much bigger thing as people couldn't go out. And now it has completely revolutionized dog training. Everybody offers a virtual, everybody offers a course of some kind, but there was really a handful in the beginning, myself included, that we had started that process in the beginning. I think, mean, so did you start your business because of COVID or after, after the disagreement, the facility got shut down and then COVID hit and you started your business? Is it sort of like that? that um, Good question. Line so, of events? so when I was 16, when I first got my first dog, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur at that point. I knew I wanted to make a lot of money, take care of my family, you know, that kind of thing. That was the big dreams at the time. 
When I went to college and I started to learn more, I kind of pushed it to the side. I pushed the business concept to the side. I said, you know what? I'm going to put that over there for a little bit. Then I did my internship and I'm focusing on my son who is a newborn at that point. So I'm like, okay, well, I can't really mess around with starting a company right now. I got to focus on my son. I got to focus on bringing money in, taking care of my family, all that stuff. And then when I got to the facility, I was making decent money. I was working 12, 14 hour long days. And at one point I had two jobs. I'd wake up early in the morning. I'd go to work at four o'clock in the morning. I'd be done by 930, 30 minutes race to the facility. And I'd be working from 10 to 10. So yeah. long, long days. And I didn't really get to see my son as a newborn. And so I was like, okay, well, I got to figure something out. So that's when it really started to pick back up again. I was like, maybe I can do my own thing, make it a little easier for me to be with my family, but also provide for them. And then when they closed down temporarily for the COVID shutdowns, I said, this is my chance. So I start filming, I start editing, I start doing everything I possibly can to set it all up. And then when they finally closed down, I was like, okay, now I can jump 100% into this. I've already done all the work. I just got to make it live, if you will. And that was kind of the catalyst to it. But it was always in the back of my mind that that's what I was going to do. I just didn't have the right timing. I didn't know what the right timing was. And COVID kind of said, hey, th this is the right time. You got to jump into it now. Yeah. I think COVID did a lot of that for a lot of people as well, myself included. It's why I started my own business. Uh, completely different. Um, tutoring children. Mm. Um, looking after them. So we can say maybe the same thing. Just go over there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's just save the concept. kids out of the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm kind of interested now in your process. If you were presented with a dog right now, let's just let's just use a general example um, off the top of your head. Where would you begin with that process? Absolutely. So the first thing we got to do is rule out why a dog's doing any particular behavior. For simplicity, let's say pulling on leash, right? There's five influences of behavior, genetics, chemistry, health, early experiences, and adult learning. So we have to rule out health, chemistry, and genetics, which is just going to the vet, right? Make sure everything is copacetic, everything is normal. Our dog doesn't have a neurological problem. They don't have a chemical imbalance, and they don't have pain in their joints, right? If a dog's walking and they stop walking all of a sudden because they're older, you might think, oh, they're just being stubborn. They don't want to walk with me but the fact might be their legs hurt or if it's too yeah. cold outside and their joints hurt, right? So we need to rule those things out. Then we need to look at early experiences and adult learning. Early experiences is just puppyhood. Between three to 16 weeks, our dogs learn everything they need to know is normal. If they were living in the woods because they ran away and they were found at six months old, they're going to have a very different early life development than a dog that was born in the city right? And gets walked around all the time. That dog's going to be totally fine with trucks and cars and skateboards and stuff. And the dog in the woods doesn't want anything to do with that. It's going to be terrified of all those sounds. Yeah. And then last, we have adult learning, which is most likely the case in almost all behavior problems. A dog is now six months old to you know, 15, 16 years old. And they're learning things in their daily life that tells them either to do it more or to not do it more. The act of pulling on the leash gets them to where they want to go. So if they want to go say hi to somebody and they pull you to go say hi and they do, they get rewarded for all that pulling. If they want to sniff the ground and they're just planted in one spot and you're trying to pull them, they're still sniffing the ground. So how do we change that? That's what the adult learning aspect is. That's all of dog training, that big chunk, which is only one fifth of the reason dogs do anything. So once we've established that, the first thing we're going to do is find out what their preferred reinforcement is. Now, I used to not do this, especially when I was at the other facility. We would just start training. We'd say, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. But really taking the time to do this where we develop, okay, what does our dog love? What do they like? And what will they tolerate? Dogs that tolerate things are most likely kibble. What they like might be cheese or store-bought treats. And then what they love might be liver, might be boiled chicken, right? The, the really valuable stuff. And so once we determine what they tolerate, what they like, and what they love, will use the things that they love for things that are really important. Recall, uh, getting their name associated. So if I say my dog's name, Hawk or Breezy or Tommy, they'll turn towards me expecting something. Yeah, That helps if I need them outside. They're running around, having a grand old time. I say their name, they should whip their head towards me and they should come right towards me, which is exactly what I want. So I want to use high value for that to encourage it to happen a lot. Yeah, Then I'll use the like for simple things like sit down, maybe place, relax with me, and maybe walking on leash. So the tolerating is kind of just maintenance. 
breakfast and dinner, maybe instead of just giving them breakfast and dinner, I might practice the things that my dog knows how to do and has had a reliable success with for breakfast and dinner. They know sit down, stay, come heel. So I'm going to practice sit down, stay, come heel every breakfast and every dinner just to keep the mind active like that. Then we move into the actual process of teaching any behavior. The first step is what is our, what do we want our dog to do? If my dog is pulling me and I would want them to stay by me, well, how specific do I need to get? Do I want them to stand to the left of me, to the right of me? Do I want them to stand behind me? Do I want them to just be in the general vicinity, which is usually what I go for? I just want my dogs to be within five feet of me, which is a standard leash. Once we become clear on that, we need to teach them. All we're going to do is successful approximation. If they're pulling, they don't get anything. If they're within a five foot radius, I could say their name and give them a treat. They start to associate staying in that space with getting treats and rewards and increasing the likelihood of them staying in there. If I were to let them get rewarded outside of the five feet, then they're going to get rewarded over there and they're going to continue to pull. Then we move on to what's called latency. It's teaching our dog when to do it and when not to do it. There are times when I take my dogs off leash or I just let the leash drag and they're allowed to go and be free. So what we want to do is create associations between words and the actions we expect our dog to do. If I want my dog to walk next to me within that five foot radius, I might say with me. And then if I allow them to go free, I might say free. Super simple. All I do is say that before the expectations put in place so they can make the association of a cause of effect. Then we move into the three Ds, duration, distance, and distraction. Those can be worked on independently or all together as your dog gets better at it. And so if we're walking on leash, how long are we walking for? Shouldn't be a 45 minute walk if our dog is struggling with walking on leash. It should be a simple two minute walk or a three minute walk, maybe not even. And then we talk about distance. So am I going far away from the house into an area my dog doesn't know? Or am I staying on the front lawn? And then finally we have distraction. So it's easier to have your dog focus inside the house or in the backyard where they're accustomed to the things going on than it is to go to New York City or you know a big area with a lot of smells and sights and sounds and all that stuff, like they're going to be overwhelmed and they're not going to listen because of how overwhelmed they are. Mm-hmm. And then the last step is to encourage them to do this behavior for the rest of their life using what's called reward schedules. This is how we maintain behavior. Instead of rewarding them constantly and you know making them fat with a whole bunch of treats, which is usually people's aversion to treats, like I don't want to make my dog fat or I don't want to get them dependent on treats. Well, if we use reward schedules, we teach them, you don't get rewarded every time, right? You get rewarded every five times or every 10 times. It's just like people. If you're going to, you know, gamble and you pull the slot machine and you get a win, awesome, but you're not going to win every time. Yet people keep pulling the lever over and over and over again. And then eventually they do win. And what happens is they get rewarded for the 150 times that they just lost. It's that valuable to them that they then do it again and again. And that's what we want our dogs to kind of get addicted to but not in a gambling kind of way, yeah. <laughs> a, a good kind of way. You know, I can totally, my, my dog is a complete diva and I can totally imagine her just sort of sitting at the slot machine right now, <laughs> just uh, getting away. <laughs> um, so remind me, what were those five things that you mentioned at the start? We talked about health. We talked about chemistry, early experiences. Early experiences, adult learning and genetics. Adult learning and genetics. All right, making sure I've right. got my notes all sorted there. Right, three of those you can you can't do anything about, and two of those you can. Yeah. 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 All right, brilliant. Um, something else I thought I wanted to bring up as well, and you mentioned this in one of your podcast episodes, is environment, and mm-hmm. something I completely agree with because I've lived in both the country and the city. I'm a country boy at heart, um, and I know when I get to the city, I'm like, oh my god, what the what. Oh my goodness. I, I can get overwhelmed sometimes. And I know that my current dog, Lexa, she's mm. very much a city girl. She's lived in this city all of her life. She's a Milton Keynes girl. And taking her out to the country, I do notice that she does go for, and we love to go out to the country sometimes, uh, she's sniffing everything. And mm-hmm. I think one piece of advice that I did pick up on way back in the early days was let them sniff, let them because that's how they understand the world. Definitely. It's how they, they bring in new information, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we don't have an exact science on how many times greater their nose is than ours, but we can assume it's over 10,000 times stronger. They can yeah. smell just an a, a, a enormous amount of smells and information and they process it all. And then if you have a dog that's used to the city and you bring them to a new area like the country, 
their smells that they've never smelled before. Yeah. Right? Like they might be fine in the city because they smell them all the time. It's the same stuff. You take them to the country, it's completely different and vice versa. Yeah. Is it good to take them to the different environments so or she, she just Absolutely. keep them to their own? Absolutely. Especially during that early socialization period between three to 16 weeks. Everything yeah. you want them to know is normal should happen in that area. Cars, planes, skateboards, bicycles. You're going to put them in the front seat. You're going to put them in the trunk. You want to be able to hold them and manipulate them, clip their nails, all that stuff. They should get used to because if they don't, as they get older, you're going to have to do a lot more training. Mm -hmm. A lot of service dog and working dog environments, what they'll do is they spend that three to 12, uh, three to 16 week area doing everything socialization. They bring them everywhere. They handle them. They flip them upside down. There's a whole a list of everything that you're supposed to do with those puppies. And if those dogs don't get used to those things, they wash out of the program. They just don't become working dogs. They don't become yeah. service dogs. They have a career change is what they call it in the <laughs> industry. <laughs> they essentially get washed out and become companion, relaxed, happy-go-lucky dogs on the couch. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? That's the best life though, isn't it? Yeah, it depends. <laughs> depends on the dog. <laughs> um, now, when you are presented with a new dog, what are you looking for? Are there any particular things that you're looking for? Any particular behaviors or mannerisms? What are you looking for? Essentially, in my system, the breakdown for dogs is always the same. We find out what we want the dog to do, how can we teach it, put it on and off cue, right? When we want to do it, when we don't want to do it, we work on the distraction, duration, and distance, and then we maintain that behavior forever. What I'm really looking at is two things. The person who owns the dog, their personality, and where our dog is now temperament and emotional wise. If the person that I'm working with is very astute, organized, objective thinker, uh, you know, they like, they're like a computer, then what I'm going to use is terminology that is more scientific because that's what resonates with them. If they're an individual who takes a lot of blame and they're like, oh, well, you know, I just didn't do enough work with my dog today. I just, I didn't, I didn't do what I was supposed to. It's my fault. Then I need to be a little more encouraging, right? So mm -hmm. there's a different personality that goes into that and how it relates to training their dog. Because if they're really soft and they take on the blame, but their dog is actually really aggressive, then we have a, a, a clash, right? The dog's just going to walk all over the person. And if we have a dog of an owner that's really organized and looking at things analytically, but they don't know what to look for with the dog, then they're struggling because they're like, well, I don't know what my dog's trying to tell me. And this is what mm -hmm. I struggled early on with. My significant other happened to also be a dog trainer. She's now switched professions to a welder, but she was able to look at a dog and go, oh yeah, I know exactly what that dog's thinking. I was not. I was. Yeah. I read textbooks. I studied YouTube videos when in the early days and then all the science. So when I looked at a dog, I had to go through a checklist. I was like, okay, well, what do the ears look like? What does the body tension look like? How do they, the tail, where is that moving? Is it low, high? Is it medium? Is it wagging or is it still? Is everything stiff? Is the face pulled back? Like all of those things I'd have to look at and then discern, well, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. And so when I'm looking at the dog, I'm looking, is this dog afraid, excited, overconfident, or aggressive? That's kind of it. If they're afraid, we got to build up their confidence before we do anything else. Oh, my dog doesn't walk on leash. Well, they're afraid. They don't want to be outside because they're so terrified. And therefore, there's nothing you can do at that moment besides build up their confidence. You can't give them more treats because they're not taking them. They're too scared. And you can't yeah. correct them because you're only making it worse. So we have to build yeah. up their confidence outside first, and then we can do the other training. If they're overexcited or overstimulated or overconfident, then they're just all over the place and we got to slow them down. And then if they're aggressive, we have to figure out why they're aggressive. Is there a social dominant aspect? Is it? Is it a genetic thing? Is it a chemical imbalance? Or are they actually afraid, which is often the case? They're afraid yep. and they lash out to try to create more space. And when they do that, they get rewarded because people back away. Yeah. So that's what All I right, want to so, look for. Yeah. Yeah. So it's sort of like knowing the partnership and at the same time knowing your uh, for want of a better word, knowing your audience, knowing what Definitely. information and what method is going to work best. Definitely. And it has to be individualistic. You know, yeah. uh, a lot of the online courses that I do, they're broken up into different sections for that reason. So I do a demonstration for the people who need more of a hands-on kind of eye learning skill. They also get more of an explanation in the scientific mm -hmm. aspect so they can more deeply understand it. Because once they understand the principles, the mechanics become much easier. And so I pepper in all of these different levels so that no matter who's watching it, they start to develop 
the skill set that I want them to in order to succeed with their doc. So I wanted to ask you about as well is because I'm sure you 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 faced a couple of challenges in your career so far. Is there one dog that was the biggest challenge for you? <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> uh, this dog's name is Piper. She's mm-hmm. a Wheaton Terrier, and since her, whenever I see a Wheaton Terrier, I think of her, and I don't like Wheaton Terriers. I love all dogs. I'll, I, you know, I'll work with every dog, but Wheaton Terriers give me just a little like a chill down my spine. We had gotten this dog in. This is when I was working at a facility. We had gotten this Wheaton Terrier in and the gentleman brought her in. She was about four or five years old, brought her in because she just started becoming aggressive. She had bit two nurses at the time. And so we're we're doing what's called a behavioral assessment. You want to see what the limits are. And I don't like doing these. I don't do them now. But I did at the facility because we were in an enclosed space. If this dog wasn't safe to be there, then we couldn't have it there and we'd have to you know, recommend it to somewhere else. And so we determined, okay, we can definitely work with this dog. And me being the most senior trainer there was tasked with working with this dog. This dog also didn't like men in particular. Had no yeah. problem with the female trainers we had. But of course, I was the only man besides the owner of the company. And so I ended up working with this dog for weeks. We're trying to do positive reinforcement. We are doing tricks, all this stuff. And the dog's starting to get it. The the dog is starting to interact with me. But the owner was always holding the leash. And this was where we needed to make the switch. So the owner's sitting down, holding the leash. I have all the treats, rewarding. Dog's performing perfectly. Obedience is doing tricks. It had um, reach for the sky. So it put its hands up and then it'd fall down and roll over. It was very cute. And it had no problem. So we said, okay, you know, let's close the gap. Let's close the distance. But I didn't want to reach for the leash because I knew there was something wrong. There was something off. I was like, I don't know. There's something about this. But the dog was nice and relaxed, super calm. And then snaps at me, just lunges, grabbed the keys in my pocket. I was able to get far enough back where it grabbed the keys in my pocket. And I slip away and I go, okay, no worries. Like everything's fine. I didn't get bit. And we went back to practicing. And this was kind of the, the temperament of the dog. If everything was cool, it was great, but it almost forgot that it was supposed to be aggressive. It was like, wait a second. Why why am I having fun? I'm supposed to be aggressive to this guy. And so we ended up working on it. It took a very long time. I think it took five or six months of just constant twice a week. He came in and he had to do his homework every other day. Just a lot of work, a lot of work. And we ended up switching over. So I was able to take the leash and pass him to somebody that the dog liked and we were able to do that. So there was a bunch of different techniques we had to use, but that dog always gave me the the chills because it didn't have any warnings. Usually when a dog yeah. is aggressive, they warn because they don't want to be confrontational. This dog did not. It had it it did not care. It would just switch from everything's fine, I'm taking treats for every, you know, hunky dory and then boom become aggressive. We didn't end up finishing because that facility closed down unfortunately due to COVID. It was right right before COVID. And so I haven't heard from him since. I hope everything's well. Things were going really well. So I hope he kept the training up. But at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do at a certain point, training wise, like in session. A lot of it happens when they go home. You know, I've I've had clients that come in and they want to do a particular thing. I say, okay, cool. What are we doing at home to work on it? They said, nothing. That's why we're here. And I said, okay, we start working on things. They go home. They don't do anything. Next week, they come back. Problem's still there. They're complaining about things. And we say, okay, well, what'd you do this week? So oftentimes I'll sit down with clients and we write out their whole schedule. I go, okay, when are you headed to work? When did you take a shower? When did you have breakfast? When did they have breakfast? All that stuff. Because there's five minutes here and there that could make all the difference long-term if someone puts in the work. I think for a lot of things as well, those five minutes here and there, like it doesn't matter what you're doing. They they do add up. Absolutely. Um, you also mentioned as well, uh, Piper doesn't like men. And that's actually brought me up to a question I've always wanted to ask. Why is it some dogs just don't like either men or don't like women for whatever reason? It's most likely in that early development stage. So oftentimes breeders happen to be female. Yeah. And so for the first three to 12 weeks, if a female is taking care of the dog, it's never around a man. Yeah. So then it grows up and it's never met them, never met them, finally meets them. And what often happens is 
the dad, usually the dad, they have an authoritative voice. It's thundering. It's booming. They yell at the dog once or twice and the dog's like, oh, snap. I don't like that. And so they develop this adverse association to a male figure. It doesn't even have to be yeah. a man, right? It could be a, a female with that kind of demeanor. They're large. They're, they have broad shoulders. Maybe they're wearing a hat, covers their eyes. Dogs like to look at your eyes. So if you're wearing a hat, they're going to be stressed out more. Or boots. Dogs are often afraid of boots because of the thunderous clap that hits the ground when they walk. All right. But at least, you know, that makes it sound so simple. And I'm like, I should have put, <laughs> I should have drawn that correlation from when I was, when I, when I studied psychology. I should, I should have known that. Um, but yeah, no, those early experiences, doesn't matter what species it is as well. Mm -hmm. It is, they are formative, aren't they? They really do Absolutely. shape who someone becomes or who some dog becomes. Absolutely. And that's what we've noticed with my three-year-old son. Like everything we've done, he's grown up during COVID. And so he's a little socially awkward because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he just didn't have <laughs> friends and stuff. But now that he, you know, he's in daycare and he's doing everything out into the world, because of how we set up everything in the beginning, you know, we'd talk to him, we'd ask him difficult questions, we'd try to get him to talk. Like he knows how to be polite to a certain extent. It's, it's very refreshing to most people when they're like, oh my God, he's such a sweetheart. He's so polite. And it's because he didn't have any negative experiences for the first two and a half years of his life. He only yeah. had please and thank you because we were so strict on those things because we wanted him to grow up to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely fair. Now, um, sort of staying in sort of kind of the realm of psychology, uh, mm -hmm. I know you have some opinions on the alpha dog theory, and I have a suspicion we're in alignment, but I'll let you, I'll let you discuss that first. <laughs> so, so the alpha theory came about as a study, and yep. right after the individual who discovered it, right yep. after he like published it, he went back on it. He said, wait a yep. second, yep. I was wrong, yep. guys. And it like people just ran with it. And it's because it gives us something to look towards, to emulate. And so instead yeah. of alpha, I like to say if there's a leader, if you can picture a leader, because a leader helps educate the followers and works with them. Mm -hmm. Right? The alpha or the boss is more of a domineering figure. Oh, you got to do what I say because I'm in charge. That's not what a leader yes. does. A leader is about uplifting and trying to teach and educate and support as much as they can. And so the alpha theory, yeah. Once it came out, the guy was like, oh, no. And he's been trying the rest of his life to help switch the narrative on it. And it's almost mm -hmm. impossible with the amount of people out there pushing the alpha theory. I'm desperately trying to remember his name right now, but I know exactly who you're talking about. It slips uh, me all the time. <laughs> I talk yeah. about it all the time. It slips me every time. I feel so bad. No, genuinely, because he, like you said, he 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 rescinded it almost immediately. But it's it's one of those ideas, and that's why science communication is really really interesting to me. I'm going to get slightly off topic here, because it only took that one media appearance, that one slip, that one news article for the concept of the alpha dog to enter the public consciousness and. Um, we can see the effect that's also had on the wider society, not just in the dog training world. And it's, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've noticed this more recently, uh, or I've thought about it more recently. There is a large gap between what professionals know, and yep. I'm going to call them lay people, right? Like just the yep. people with companion yep. dogs. And it always seems to be at the same interval. So as companion dog people learn something, the professionals are learning the next thing. And so there's always like this 10 or 15 year gap. The things that yeah. we studied a long time ago, people are now starting to be like, oh, that's a really good idea. <laughs> it's like, well, we've yeah. been doing it for this long. I think that's kind of the thing that happens with education as well. I know educational psychology is, and all respect to, I've got a few friends who are doing educational psychology and are doing some great work. It's about 50 years behind current practice. 50 years, wow. Yeah. But in general, kind of what happens is we kind of like, I like to imagine sort of like a, a bunch of balls, uh, mm. perhaps. Um, sort of like, so you've got like sort of like the center of the ball is kind of like the knowledge we learn in, uh, for, for, for you guys over in America, in elementary school. And then there's, there's sort of like the bits around the outside. Uh, that's what you'd learn in high school. Mm -hmm. A little bit further around the edge, that's maybe what you'd learn in sort of college or university. And then only as you get to the masters, you get sort of like to the edge. And then you get right. the PhD, which is just that tiny little bit of extra knowledge that just adds to the greater whole. 
Right. Right. I like to think of knowledge as in things you know that you know, things that yeah. you don't know that you know, and things that you don't know you don't know. Yeah. So I, I love that concept because it helps me realize there's so much that I don't know and there's so many things, so many avenues that I could still go and explore, even just in dog training in this one niche, mm-hmm. you know, and let alone everything else in the world. Yeah. And you know what? Um, talking of loads of avenues, we could we could literally talk, I think, for the next four hours, but it's also <laughs> absolutely freezing cold here in the UK. Um, so before we go on to our questionnaire, um, where could I find you online? Where can I find your podcast, your YouTube channel? Where can I find your website? Absolutely. You can find everything at matadork9.com. That's K in the number nine.com. And then you can follow me on any social media platform, Matador K9. Super simple. It's actually spelt out there, C-A-N-I-N-E. But matadork9.com is where everything is put. The podcast is there. Our blog is there. You can get my copy of the Dog Training Cheat Codes, which is one of the books that I wrote. Uh, and all of the courses and information that I provide to my clientele is there at matadork9.com. All right. And all of that, all those links will be in the description below. And I love how I pointed. Like you can, <laughs> you can sort of tell I'm going to put this one on YouTube. There, <laughs> go down. <laughs> it's there. It's right, right down there. <laughs> so I will finish every question, every uh, podcast with the questionnaire. Uh, these questions come from the Prost questionnaire, which were later adapted by Bernard Pivot and then by James Lipton. And now I present my Barking Up the Wrong Tree adaptation to you. <laughs> See what I did there? I see. It's on the pond. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite word? My favorite word? Proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Could you spell that? <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I love the word because I had to do a presentation on it. And I made it a goal to put proprio- proprioceptive muscular facilitation in it as much as I could. And proprioceptive muscular, fa- proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation is when you are stretching and you actively engage the muscles involved to help, mm-hmm. uh, you know, strengthen and elongate those muscles intentionally. You're not just a passive exercise; you're intentionally do it. And we can do it with conditioning in dogs to strengthen them. They're not necessarily, you know, we don't know that they're thinking about those things, but we can trigger some type of stimulus or response so that they can become stronger and they can be more adept and healthier in situations like aggression uh, control for police dogs or agility and that kind of stuff. Proprioceptive mm-hmm. neuromuscular facilitation. <laughs> it reminds me, um, I, in my first year of my degree, I studied uh, Mile Csikszentmihalyi, who mm. is the first person who was able to label flow. It's sort of like, if you're in the moment, it's yeah. that sensation. And um, I managed to pronounce his name six different ways in a 15 minute presentation. <laughs> so, <Just keep> butchering. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I just utterly destroyed his name. And I'm so sorry because he's an utterly wonderful researcher um, and sorely missed in the psychology world. All right. The opposite question What is your least favorite word? Hmm. Least favorite word. I don't know if I have one. I appreciate all of the English language. I don't know any other language. I only speak English. But I would have to say, I guess most commonly I hear that moist or ligament are pretty bad words. They're pretty bone chilling. So I'd have to go with those two. But I don't have a... I, I was dyslexic. Well, I am dyslexic. I wasn't was. I didn't fix it. But I am dyslexic. Yeah, and so yeah. I've learned how to uh, develop a reading love if you will and so that's why i don't say that i don't like words because i I guess i've switched my brain through psychology to learn how to like reading and that kind of stuff so moist and ligament though (laughs) me too me too (laughs) dyslexic as well um and you do there are things that we 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 sort of do we adapt to it and it's maybe not the most efficient way to read but we have our ways yeah you gotta Um, do it one way or another yeah um what engages you If it has a very large impact on the most amount of people. Uh, When Mm -hmm. I was in college, I was an RA. I was an orientation leader. Uh, I was overwhelmingly interested in the involvement of students and trying to do more. I was president of a couple things. I was in the student government association. And then as I got out of there, like I just, I've done everything I could to get the most amount of people in one room to all benefit because that's what Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to do in my life. Mm Self-help books. Like the first book I ever took out of a library was a self-help book. 
It was how to skateboard. I remember I was like seven years old or something. The first book I ever willingly took out of a library, how to skateboard. And that kind of catapulted the need to want to learn and digest information and then spray it, uh, spray it, spread it with as many people <laughs> as I could. <laughs> Don't go, do you know, you got to combine dog training with skateboarding. Yeah. I, it's, Scare it, dogs. It's, it's possible. People do it. I just yeah. don't have a skateboard. I got to get a skateboard now. <laughs> <laughs> what disengages you? Disengages me. Great question. Uh, probably conflict. I'm mm. not one to I, – I have no problem with conflict. I have a black belt in Shaolin Kenpo Karate. Uh, you know, I've, I've worked in those kind of situations. I was an RA. Like there's certain things that happen. So I have no problem with conflict, but I would rather avoid them if possible. If we can talk about yeah. things, if I can sit down. So those things disengage me because I'm not – it's not worth my time or energy to fight with somebody who's not ready to listen. Or to share information if they're not ready to listen. I'm not going to shove yeah. that stuff down your throat or into your ears. I'm just going to – if you want to take it, fantastic. You'll benefit from it. If you don't, then okay. Yeah. What sound of noise do you love? I do love music, all different types of music. But jazz or guitar is probably my favorite. If there was just a – you know, oh, wait. Hold on. Take a step back. I can't believe yeah. I forgot about my favorite instrument that's ever existed. It's the cello. I don't play the cello and I refuse to learn because I play the trumpet, the piano, the guitar. Uh, I, I wanted to learn the cello and I stopped myself because I knew I would ruin it. From hours of practicing the cello, I would ruin the sound. And so I let the professionals yeah. do it. And I love listening to it. I know the new Wednesday Adam show, or I think it's just called Wednesday on Netflix. Uh, yeah. They have a cello piece that I have yet to listen to, but apparently it's fantastic. Yeah. What sound of noise do you hate? Probably very high pitched dog barking. Because I've, I've heard it quite a lot, especially in shelters, which I understand they're stressed, they're frustrated. I totally get it. And so that's why it's better to have a more calming and relaxing, <clears throat> excuse me, more of a calming and relaxing environment in a kennel. But mm -hmm. high pitched barking goes straight through my soul every time. <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? My favorite curse word? Hmm. I don't know. I don't necessarily curse very often because I do have a three-year-old son. And so I've, I've kind of, I will tell you my favorite habit when it comes to curse words. How about that? Yeah. When we, were, when we were in the uh, Boy Scouts, my brother and I, we would curse, but we wouldn't say it. And so we would often swap the word out for something else, which is very common, but we would just yeah. pretend that like a, a, an audio track skipped. And then sometimes we would do the inverse. And so if it was a, a two part, like bull blank, then you wouldn't say bull, but you would say the other word. And so that was a fun game between my brother and I. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Voice acting. I would love to You've be had a two voice on this actor. Podcast. Really? Yeah. I would I would love to be a voice actor. I think it would be very rewarding. Everybody tells me that I have a very nice voice and, and it's somber. And that's the one reason I well, one of the reasons that I started the Acknowledge Dogs podcast. It's because I felt that that was a great medium for me to get my message out to the world. And there hadn't been many dog training podcasts out there. I think I'm I have the most episodes of any dog training podcast. We just did 161. So, you know. My voice being a catalyst to get out there into the world, which it wasn't always, you know, I, I was a very shy kid when I was younger. I didn't want to do much in terms of public speaking or on stages. And as I went into college, I kind of developed as more of an individual who loved doing those things. And so I would say voice acting, I'd love to be an animated voice actor. I don't think I'd want my face. Well, I guess if you're a voice actor, your face isn't going to be anywhere anyway. Yeah. But I wouldn't want them to use my face as an animation. I'll put yeah. it that way. I'd want There's to be you know, like a card. Yeah, motion captures. I wouldn't yeah. want to do a motion capture, although it might be fun to try. I think just yeah. regular animated voice acting would be great. Mm -hmm. What profession would you not like to do? Hmm. Well, as a father, I would do anything to provide for my family, but I probably would not want to be a nuclear cleaner. Like someone who cleans up nuclear waste. <laughs> I could just be shortening my lifespan at that point. If I had to, I would, but I probably don't want to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all respect to any nuclear cleaners that are listening. Right. You're uh, fantastic. We need you. I love it. It's just not something I want to do. I appreciate you're doing it, so I don't have to. That's all. <laughs> yeah. 
Final question of the questionnaire. If you could say only one statement to any one person, what would that statement be? And who would that person be? I would talk to my professor from college. Uh, his name is Dr. Stephen McKenzie. Unfortunately, he passed last year. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, that's okay. It's all right. Um, he he was the one who developed the canine program at the college that I was at. He spent 40 years training dogs, police, military, and he took all that information and he saw exactly what I do, where I put my voice out there. He put his voice out there to help change the next generation because what he saw was you know, corrective methods and outdated techniques and he wanted to change it, but he knew he couldn't do it at that level of people who are older and they have done it for 20 years. That's just how they're going to do it. And so he saw it as a way to change the future by changing the, the younger youth today who are going to get into the industry. And so I would thank him for all of the hard work that he did. And I hope he would be proud of what I've done and the impact I've had on people's lives as a catalyst from his knowledge and information. Hi, everyone. This is JJ, the co-founder of Good Pods. If you haven't heard of it yet, Good Pods is like Goodreads or Instagram, but for podcasts. It's new, it's social, it's different, and it's growing really fast. There are more than 2 million podcasts, and we know that it is impossible to figure out what to listen to. On Good Pods, you follow your friends and podcasters to see what they like. That is the number one way to discover new shows and episodes. You can find Good Pods on the web or download the app. Happy listening. I've got a goal in mind for this podcast. Currently, we are on the Good Pods Top 100 Indie Documentary Chart, and we're currently chilling at number 33, which is a really awesome place to be. You've helped us get there, so thank you so much for that. But I wonder, can we break 30 in the next week or so? That would be absolutely awesome. If you could jump over to Good Pods, leave a rating and a review, and that will really, really help this show grow. Second favour to ask from you as well. Some of the more observant of you might notice that the format's changing slightly. And this is a good thing because I'm also doing a video version of this. And you can find this on our YouTube channel. Uh, quite simply search for Tom Meets Interesting People. Same with the podcast. I'll leave a link in the, uh, in the notes below. And I'd love to see you there. You can actually see what I look like. And... We'll be honest, probably wish I stayed audio. <laughs>